All right, hey, thanks for joining us today. Kenny Porter here, KP's Black Box. I'm excited to have uh, a new friend and, uh, well, I say friend, there's a love-hate relationship that I have with this guest. Um, her name is Cheryl Zonkowski. She is a dietitian, a performance dietitian. We're going to find out what that is in just a few minutes. Um, but before we get into uh, talking with Cheryl today, I want to give a shout out to our nation's uh, space program, NASA. Tomorrow, hopefully, or at the time we're shooting this uh, video podcast, we're about to put two more men into orbit, and that's really exciting and fun. And um, Cheryl, I'm going to try out for Space Force. I don't know if I told you that off camera or not. But you did not. Yeah, that's why I hired you as a nutritionist to get my body ready. <clears throat> Total bullshit. But <laughs> we got some work to do. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> oh man, I just got slammed right at the beginning. Can we cut? We're, we're going to start over. <laughs> just kidding. We let everything go. Radical transparency, radical truth. All right. So, anyways, NASA, uh, Elon Musk, good luck, SpaceX. Let's hope we get them in the space and get them home safely. That's really exciting for our country. So. Um, just we'll start there how about the space program have you ever done anything for astronauts and probably maybe no uh Uh, existing astronauts no but gentlemen who are in training yes really Mm -hmm. so what do space aliens and astronauts eat when when they're in outer space well i haven't had any conversation with space aliens to my knowledge okay well there's three back there. We'll okay. even talk to them afterwards. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so, well, astronauts, they I guess there's a different way you prepare meals. There's a different diet in space than there is. Right. The whole, the whole gravity piece. So, yes, the freeze-dried food, things that are easily accessible. Similar to the concept of MREs, but different consistency, not adding water, not reheating. Okay. Wow. Um, and you've done that. You've you've talked with some previous some astronauts. gentlemen who were in yeah. training for the program. Okay. Yes. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that in a little while. Well, let me officially welcome our guest uh, Cheryl Zonkowski to our show today. Thank you so much for being here. And in true uh, transparency, Cheryl is trying to help me improve my body as a fifty-year-old. And uh, she was referred to me uh, from one of my clients and great friends. Shout out to Lou out there, um, one of our special warriors in the world. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to get you for referring Cheryl to me. But, no, it's actually been good. I was telling you off camera that it was really surprising to me that when we we got our first meals from your um, catering firm, catering company, Um, The portions that I was able to eat, I was like, holy cow, Cheryl expects me to eat all this food. I'm trying to improve my fitness and maybe lose some weight. Nine pounds I've lost so far in about 30 days. Nice. So thank you. That's all you. Kathleen, thanks you. For me, I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, in preparing these meals, that there was so much food to consume. And I was telling you off camera, I was like, a lot of times I can't finish my meal. Mm-hmm. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes and we'll talk about um, the carb to vegetable to protein. And I'll, I'll share on your, your website uh, your take on that as a professional. Take me back a little bit, if I can, to the beginning of your career. What led you into this field? Because looking at your bio, you're, you've got a psychology background. Uh, you've got a science background, you've got a nutrition background, you've worked with our nation's top warriors in special warfare, which is really cool. So uh, shout out to those guys and thank you for serving those guys well, those men and women in uniform. Um, so give me a little background on how you got into this industry of nutrition. 
chance, happenstance. I don't really know what you want to call it. I was originally pre-med two years into college, and I was working as a supervisor for intramural fields. Grew up playing sports, loved sports, watched sports. Um, grew up in the Northeast, big football fans in my family. Um, and I was down at the University of Florida working in the intramural sports and having a conversation with one of our athletic trainers who was at the field that night in case of injury, something along those lines. And they happened to mention, did you know that there is a dietitian that works for our athletic association? Hmm. And I said, seriously, someone who works with athletes and food. It's like, <laughs> those are my two favorite things, sports and food, what could be better? <clears throat> and I looked her up and got a meeting with her. And for my junior year of college, I said, I want to volunteer with you. And by the end of my junior year, we were having my evaluation. And she said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be you. And four years later, she actually retired and the school called wow. me and I went back. And that's how I became Florida's director of sports nutrition. Wow. At Flo okay. Yeah. So what years was that? I started as their director in 2005. Wow. It, it, which were you like 16 then? Oh, what, thank you. <laughs> Look at you being sweet. <laughs> Brownie points there. <laughs> That's so I can get some extra oatmeal in my my meal later. Mm -hmm. um, so University of Florida was that during the days of Tim Tebow or? It was. Yeah. I would like to think that some of what they were eating contributed to some of those victories. It was the Tim Tebow, the back-to-back -back basketball championships. We yeah. had some SEC and NCAA swimming and diving gymnastics. It was a, it was you, a solid run. You heard it run. here. Cheryl Zonkowski. She brought the University of Florida onto the map. That's a lie. But okay. I would like to think fact they, check, were, fact they were check fueled guys. well yeah. for their yeah. performance. Yeah. Urban Myers was like, hey, get this girl on the field. Feed these guys well, right? So... Did you work with the football program, or did you work with all the, the programs? That so as the director, I oversaw all of the programs, but I had a, we had a staff at Florida. Florida is wow. a very well-resourced university, so I had a coordinator, and she and I split the sports at the time. And then we had three graduate assistants and about 10 undergraduate volunteers running the sports nutrition program. That's awesome. And you did that for fi five years? Yeah, five to six years. Yeah. And then left from there, where did, where did you go from? So University? then I went to Naval Special Warfare over in Coronado in okay. January of 11. Uh -huh. San Diego, beautiful, beautiful it place. It was gorgeous. Yeah. That was a really tough duty, huh? It was hard. It was hard. I mean, Florida to San Diego. I, I went from the beach life to the beach life. So what's it like going from working with collegiate athletes to these al mainly alpha males, you know, studs of the universe um is there any correlation or is there any what's what's the same what's similar what's different you would be surprised at the similarities when it comes to mindsets and the way that they carry themselves um i refer to the the fishbowl concept in college athletics the coaching staffs the athletes depending yeah. on what sport the funding etc they were the biggest fish in their bowl at that point in time. So the some of the uh, egos and mindsets were very much the same. Not to say that everyone has an ego necessarily, but there wasn't the stark contrast that some people assume that there would well, be. Well, there's no egos at Naval Special Warfare. No, no none. Those guys are... A bunch of sweethearts. Teddy, yeah, teddy, teddy bears. bears. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, and that's true. And there actually are a very, great number of <clears throat> teddy bears that I work with. Yeah. Lose a teddy bear. Absolutely. Yeah, big teddy bear. Mm -hmm. But they have they have the just, ability to flip the switch. Yeah. And that's part of how and why they're recruited and the way that they do what they do. Right, right. I was gonna say you just don't piss the, the papa bear off or mama bear and you'll be fine. They get extra oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Always extra oatmeal. So so the the oatmeal I was telling you again off camera that that's one of my favorite things in what you've prepared and you have this this peanut butter mm -hmm. oatmeal concoction that is like my my favorite thing to eat um it's the joy of my day when i see that i've got that uh prepared so thank you but tell me a little bit about that in terms of how you prepare meals for these um extraordinary athletes to special warfare uh, soldiers and sailors. Any Marines? You work with any Marines by chance? There were some that came through. Yeah, they those have were temporary the duties. Those were the best. I right? don't play favorites. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, I will say those are the best. <laughs> best fraternity in the world. 
Um, no, sorry. There's the Army, and then those who can't make it into the Marines, there's the Army. So um, that goes out for my son, too. There you go, Izzy. Um, so when we're, we're thinking about these these mills and how they're prepared, um, Ian, if you can, put up on the screen, I'd like to talk to Cheryl about... Uh, you know, we were talking off camera about some people refer to it as portion control. Mm-hmm. You don't like to think of it that way. So h- help me understand the way you would define portion control. So I like to think of myself as a, a teacher, a sharer of knowledge based on what the scientific evidence says. Uh, my goal is to work myself out of a job, to actually help people reacclimate to their hunger and satiety cues and be able to hear what their body is saying and choose whether or not they decide to listen. I mean, if you want some ice cream at that moment, it's chunky not monkey. necessarily a bad idea to have some chunky monkey ice cream, but should all meals, every meal be chunky monkey ice cream? And that goes back to the concept of fueling. Well, I, I, I told you off camera, I wanted to um, put a picture up today and I didn't get it to Zach in time, but have a picture of chunky monkey. <laughs> And in, in relation to your carb, protein, vegetable, my website, I'm going to be a nutritionist too, but it's all going to be based around Chunky Monkey. That you get your walnuts, you get your bananas, you get your, your carbs, you get your chocolate. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so my diet portion is going to be Chunky Monkey. How much do you want to eat? Half a pint, a whole pint, a bite? Probably not the way we want to feed our bodies though, right? So... We'll, we'll go back to your expertise. I'm just kidding. I probably shouldn't. Well, that's okay. Shouldn't do that. I was going to say we should have the cameras follow you around for those first couple of days to see how well fueled you are and what your performance, mental and physical, looks like. Yeah. If I would have, you know, I could have done a big shout out for you today and, and look at me 30 days ago and look at me now. Um, yeah. No, seriously, it's, I, I have not like overexerted myself and exercise and Ian's proof of that, my son-in-law behind the camera over there, um, but still have lost weight, but been satisfied. I haven't had a day where I've been like, oh my God, why am I eating this way? I'm, I'm hungry or I'm uh, hangry. Mm-hmm. Um, that just hasn't happened for me. So that's really cool. And, and how you do it. So what's the science behind that? How can you take somebody like me who's uh, an addict as it relates to Chunky Monkey mm-hmm. Um, and I love ice cream. I love sweets. But the way you put together that that meal plan, um, I, I didn't have those crazy cravings. I, I, I do have to admit, maybe day one, maybe day two, it was a little strange. Excuse me. But I didn't have um, I didn't have these massive cravings. So, what's the science behind that? So blood sugar regulation is the premise of kind of keeping your energy levels nice and stable and steady throughout the day. Basically a boring roller coaster, if you will. Not a lot of ups, not a lot of downs, just kind of tracking. To do that, pairing macronutrients together is kind of the the magic in that puzzle. Macronutrients. Mm-hmm. So, mac, so I think macroeconomics. Okay. <clears throat> a little different. So macro, micro, what, what are macronutrients macronutrients are the main contributors to what your body breaks down and is able to turn into energy every day so we're talking about proteins rule of thumb kind of anything that is an animal or is from an animal carbohydrates anything that came from the ground or grew at one point in time no matter how doctored by man and then fats which i kind of refer to as garnishes but basically anything that you marinate your food in top your food with or add to your food to make it taste a little better where does Chunky Monkey fall in that? We're going to go with carb, even okay. though I, I, I acknowledge your breakdown. In there, yeah, I, in I, I like your thought process. And You've ben learned something. Really, I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you can read their ingredients. They're, they're all healthy. Yep, they're in there. But it's just the combination, I guess, of right. those that become. The pairing is a little lopsided to uh, the carbohydrate. The pairing. Yes. So in your screen here, and Ian, if you can pull that up again, that, that's a good segue into pairing. Um, there's a photo here on your website of uh, you've got carb, protein, vegetables, and you break it up 20% carb, 30% protein, 50% vegetables, and you're using this fist analogy. Mm-hmm. 
So every individual, okay. if you're trying to go back, so the entire premise of these plates, we kind of alluded to it before, is consuming enough food to make you satisfied and for the number of hours is up to the individual. If you like the three square meal plan, then you get four fist allocations per meal. If you prefer the grazer six, you know, meals a day, you get two fists okay. per eating opportunity. And for those who are doing kind of the intermittent fasting thing where they're only eating twice a day in a smaller window, then you get fist, six fist allocations for your two meals. But the percentages would break down the same. So, Ian, pull, pull this up on the screen while we're talking, if you can. So, um, in kind of the plate allocation here, this is a lot like investments where you're allocating, you know, maybe a portion of your portfolio to equities or stocks, a portion to bonds, maybe another portion to uh, non-correlated. I'm trying to show off now that I know. Well, that's fine because I have no idea what you're talking about, yeah. so I'm sitting here smiling yeah, that's and right. nodding. Can, that's the same thing I'm doing with food. I'm like, can I eat that? And can I eat that? And where's the chunky monkey at on here? Um so, you know, going through these um, these different images here, um, there's there's this half vegetable too, and you're saying fifty percent vegetables, thirty percent protein. So, are you saying if you want more vegetables, maybe in a, a setting when you're eating uh, a meal, if you say, okay, I want two servings of vegetables, what do I have to give up on my my plate analogy here or my diversification of so the reason that there are so many plates is because there's a spectrum of recommendations so when people uh, come and work with me i have to collect data on them basically each individual is the expert on themselves i just happen to be potentially super food geek and when they tell me about their job requirements their activity levels their medical history those kinds of things then okay. we start with which plate is most appropriate to them based on who they are, what they do, and then what they want to achieve fitness-wise. Okay. So if you have somebody that has a sedentary lifestyle like Noah, I'm just kidding, Noah, um, who, well, let's just say someone who doesn't exercise, mm -hmm. pr probably more like me. Um, <laughs> I'm getting these looks behind the camera over there. Um, so someone who doesn't exercise, what should their diet rule of thumb consist of? So the plate where you talked about maybe the one, 25% carbs, okay. meaning uh, starches and sugars with the 50%. So the vegetables are actually the fiber contributor. So that determines how quickly those sugars get absorbed and how long they last as a fuel source. Okay. And then that 25% protein plate. The more active that you are, so if you are in a profession like construction where you're doing a lot of manual labor during the day, the carbohydrate, sugar, starch part of the plate grows because the harder that you are working, sweating, higher heart rate, the more carbohydrates you tend to be burning versus the more sedentary you are, the more fats you tend to be burning. So a guy like me, before I met you, I was probably 255. You know, now I'm down in the 240s, uh, which is awesome. Um, and that person at that weight of 255, rule of thumb, what should the calorie content be or calorie amount? Does that matter? The amount of calories that they're. Well, it does matter. Up? And those are the things that I take into account. <clears throat> I have found with re acclimating people to their hunger and satiety cues. And you've seen this on the meal plans that I've shared with you. All yeah. of the numbers are present, but the goal isn't to get people to weigh, measure, count anything necessarily because that's not sustainable for most people's lifestyles. Most people want to be able to eat, feel great, look amazing naked, but not think about it at all. Look amazing naked. No, you, you catch that. Still <laughs> perked up on that. Um, well, that's what I hear. I want to yeah. look great naked. So, I'm like, okay, let's, let's work on that. That's what all of those uh, special warfare guys say when they come in, right? First rule of thumb, we want to look great naked, right? They, they do a lot of their missions naked. That's what I hear. Um, <laughs> well, it's dark, so, you know, you can't That's what really... Lou was telling me. So you have to fact check Lou on that. I'll, uh, I'll refer back. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, you know, talking to that level and, and, and those folks that you work with that are in different um, occupations burn calories at different levels each day. 
um, that's something that the individual should really pay attention to then, right, is what their occupation is, and then that will correlate with their their portion management on their plate? Yes. Okay. Now, if they are well in tuned with their hunger and satiety cues, their body's going to tell them that. When there's a day that they're out running around, you know, long rock training session, really long workout, whatever it may be, a couple of hours after that, their body's going to say, hey, I'm hungry. I'm going to need a little bit more fuel than I usually do. But like most of us, they finish their workouts shower change, and they go into meetings for endless numbers of hours. So they're forced yeah. to obviously focus on what's important, the details of the meeting, listening to who's talking, more cognitive functioning. And even if their body is telling them that they're hungry, they don't have access to food. So they then wait till the end of the day, which most of us are guilty of the same thing, and then they do what I call backloading. They just give me everything I can get my hands on because I haven't eaten anything all day. Yeah. And at that point, your body's craving Carbs. Let me have a pie and a chunky monkey. Yes. Yeah, right? yeah. Jeez. So that's what you grab first. So what happens when when I do that? I I fall off the train. I relapse. I go have a half pint of chunky monkey because my gut is now telling me, oh, you can't eat a whole pint anymore. Mm -hmm. And now I've I've failed my mission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've got to start over again. Um, how do you coach people through that when when they do trip up or they uh, they mess up the meal strategy that you've implemented for them or that you've suggested to them? How do you encourage them to get get back on the train? What's honestly, it's the one of the hardest things for people to do. It's not a it's not a math problem. It's not well, I ate this addition, so I need to subtract this. It's a Hey, you enjoyed your ice cream Mo next morning? Have your breakfast. Move yeah. on. Erase it from your memory. Don't You don't need like the little guilty devil on your shoulder kind of a thing. Just let it go and go on about your normal fueling routine. Because again, you get up that morning, you feel like you were bad last night. So all you have is a cup of coffee. Well, what happens an hour later? Now you're back in that same boat that you were last night. I'm craving sugar. Yeah. So what are you going to grab? You know, whatever's quick. Is there a point where a person, I mean, psychologically, you, you have to be pretty, and, and some of these folks in that NSDW, or NSD, NSW world, um, I don't know where the D came from. What are you laughing at? <laughs> um, so the NSW world, these guys are amazing at being able to get back on track. They're, you know, high achievers, but take someone like myself who's kind of been out of the game for a long time. They fall off the track. They... They have that sugar crave again, or that chunky monkey lapse. Um, you can tell what's on my mind today, man. <laughs> um, but when they fall off that train and they do mess up, or they do, you know, cheat on their plan that they've designed, um, are are there any things you can share with the audience to say? Here's how you can get your mind right. Um, here's some maybe mental exercises that you can do or um, things that you can do to put yourself back in that proper mindset to eat well again. A any thoughts there? A lot of people aren't about patience. Neither are the Jensen NSW. Everybody yeah. wants that magic pill, the quick fix. Uh, a lot of times when you don't have time to eat or intentionally aren't eating, people go to caffeine. And that caffeine can dull those cues of I am hungry. So it's that combination of drink 16 to 20 ounces of water before you go grab that cup of coffee. A, do, a, do a check with yourself. It, just like your car. Do an all systems check. Am I hungry right now? Am I irritable right now? You know, all those kinds of things. If you're hungry, eat something. Don't yeah. just grab a cup of coffee because it's quick and convenient. But that requires planning and preparedness. And that's yeah. a lot of what I work with these guys. What do you have in your pockets? What do you have in your backpack? What do you have in your, you know, your cage down in the lockers for you to eat if nothing is accessible? Don't just, you know, go run to the beer mess or the snack stand and grab a handful of candies or, you know, a bag of chips. Have something like, whether it's almonds or cashews or some kind of, you know, pack with them. Be prepared. 
You know, that makes a good point. And I can think about you saying that. And I was thinking about myself and, you know, what you'd set up for uh, Kathleen, my wife, and, uh, and I, when we were starting this process out, what really made it easy for me is not only did you give us some structure and um, designing those, those mills for us, but you contract with a caterer mm -hmm. to bring those mills out to us on Sundays and Wednesdays, I, I believe it is. And um, it, it made it, we did that for 30 days, every mill. Mm -hmm. And it was a little expensive, but not crazy expensive. I'll, I'll, you can talk to Cheryl about that. But um, it, it wasn't uh, as expensive as I thought when I went back and looked at my budget and I went back and looked at, and this is before the whole COVID crisis when we could go out to eat. Right. And in, I, I feel like this is confessional a little bit today with my priest over here. Um, but, you know, we had um, a, a habit of going out to eat probably – four times a week if not more and with these guys here in the office i'd go to lunch mm -hmm. every day monday through friday and what that planning and strategy of planning these meals out and making this investment in you know 30 days of my health it really helped me become more disciplined just by having this mindset of knowing hey these meals are showing up on sunday they're showing up on Wednesday, and I can't let this stuff go to waste, and I, I can't go off track. So that that was really great. Uh, do you do that even in the community where, um, you know, the, I guess like with the NSW folks and with your other clients outside of that, do you suggest doing a meal plan where somebody delivers food to you like that to get you on track? Is that part of the, the process? I prefer the option for food to be shown to individuals. Sometimes I try to do it in my office, but the, the applied learning curve isn't quite the same. When I was in athletics, we had training tables. So the athletes were building their own plates, but those pictures were above all of the places that they would go and portion for themselves, and staff was always present. Yeah. With NSW, they have a couple of dining facilities. Where, same thing. The educational materials are up. The guys may have met with me already, or girls, and they're, they're building their plates, and someone's available for Q&A &A, yeah. a lot of the times when they're eating. With individuals, I don't necessarily have that luxury. I think that's where most learning occurs. Learning is, is visual. I mean, one, you want to eat with your eyes in the grocery store, looking at restaurant menus, but the same is true on your plate. If you have those plates appearing and they're already pre-balanced for you, you're learning subconsciously, you know, I eat this, I feel great, I want to keep eating like this. So your, your body is being trained that that's what right yeah. looks like. Yeah. I was just having this thought while you're talking through that in, in this training process that um, the question I want to ask is, who's easier to work with, male or females? Completely depends. Really? So, yeah, state of motivation. So back to that psychology piece that yeah. you mentioned, mentioned, I would have people come in my office all the time and say, I want to have this time or lift this weight or you know shoot this much better or mentally be more focused between two and four in the afternoon where I kind of get brain fog. They would have all mm -hmm. these goals and then we'd have conversations and I would hear responses like, I can't, I can't, I won't, I can't. Yeah. So their state of motivation for change was very low. But, but I would, I, I would give them all of the materials and the education and, and as a provider, that's the best that you can do. Everybody's going to take that information and do what, what they're ready to do at that point in time. That was something that was hard for me to learn in the beginning, especially with collegiate athletes. If they weren't ready, they weren't doing it. I saw it as a self yeah. failure and it's not a failure on anybody's part, but people have to be ready. They have to want to do it for the right reasons. So the reason I asked that question, Cheryl, is when we started this process and I, I started dropping the weight and it seemed like there was just a lot of water weight, like mm -hmm. the sodium retention that I was having was starting to go first. And Kat said, you know, you make me sick. Um, she might have said some other words in there too. <laughs> but um, it was, you can lose weight so fast. And I think that's a common thread with ladies when they, you know, if they're doing something with their spouse and you know, I'm 
255 and I dropped five pounds and she's thin as a rail already but has this image right um, and it's harder for her to lose the weight where she wants to lose it or to trim up where she wants to trim up and so w what's the phenomenon behind that between the the male and female species well you hit on a couple of cylinders there the first one is the farther you are from your goal regardless male or female the easier things come off in the beginning versus the closer that you are to your optimal already the longer and slower things tend to change you shouldn't have told me that so i can blow up to like 300 pounds and then <laughs> brag about how much weight I've lost. <laughs> and that, yeah. but, um, you, I mean, depending on who you talk to, that happens to people a lot. If you're far from what your body would like to be naturally, it's easier to get some of that initial yeah. excess off, but the closer that you get, the slower that it comes. So there's that point. Um, the other point is it depends on how far off the the path of right people were to begin with. If they were eating pretty balanced, then it's more you brought up calories earlier. A lot of times people have this mental concept of, I must eat less to weigh less, look less, whatever, whatever it may, may be, have less fat. And that's not necessarily the case. And this is just as true with males as it is with women. I've yeah. had this conversation. If you want to put on muscle but lean out, you need to eat. Even if the plates initially look like more, and it sounds so counterintuitive, you need to eat more to weigh less or to burn fat more effectively. And sometimes that mental crossing that bridge yeah. is the hardest part of the fight. So that that brings me to a transition and where I get to, to pick on my guys over here. So Zach over here, our, our sound guy, he's in the fitness. He likes working out. And there were a few weeks ago that – I almost had to put him in the sleeper and choke him out and practice some of my old skills um, because he was getting hangry with me. He was doing, why are you peeking over the, the monitor over there, Zach? Um, I'm telling on you. It was a skill, yeah. So he was doing kind of this modified keto thing mm -hmm. in one of those fad diets. Um, and I'm not hating on keto. You can help educate us with that here in a few minutes. But um he, he was. He was really irritable, um, and he was grumpy. But what we found out after he started sharing with us what was going on, he was carb depleting. Mm -hmm. He was cutting his carbs out, and so he was getting a little uh, grumpy in the office, and we had to send him home. Um, that's a true story. To the doctor. Yeah. To the what? The doctor. To the doctor? I had strep throat. Oh, God, you did not have strep throat. <laughs> his... <laughs> His you-know-what hurt. Um, his throat. His throat hurt, yeah. <laughs> so w what <laughs> – sorry, Cheryl. Just play with us. Go along with it. Go You're on. good. We'll have you sign a disclosure. At the <laughs> Worked in a male-dominated environment yeah. for 15 years. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> Those NSW guys, they don't say stuff like that. They're clean. Um, so w what happens in these fad diets? You know, you, you get on the train, you lose a bunch of weight, um, or you hit a fitness goal, and then all of a sudden, you're 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 back to ground zero again, and having to start over. What what's your opinion on all the different fad diets out there, from the keto to the Palm Beach to the Atkins? So you you actually alluded to this a little bit when you said the first day or two that you started, yeah, you were having some cravings. Well, when you consume carbs, whether it's starches or sugars, your body elicits a response that makes it release serotonin. And if you're unfamiliar, serotonin is what gives you that feeling of calm, awe, whether you want to call it like the post-Thanksgiving fat and happy feeling, mm. just comfort. Yeah. So carbohydrates, comforting. If you are over-consuming them relative to your activity level and have to dial back, that's kind of where the cravings, hangry, those kinds of things it originate chemically. Yeah to start with. Um, unfortunately, the first sometimes week to two weeks of re-remembering what right looks like, you just kind of have to battle through them. Because um, sometimes if you give in and overindulge, like we talked about, you just feel that guilt the next morning and you kind of start to yeah. rinse and repeat again. I'm actually not a hater of diets, whether it's you know trends and things like that. I'm familiar with some colleagues that are. 
But I believe that the most important thing is meeting a client where they are. And if someone comes in and says, this is where I am, this is what I want to do, and that's where their motivation for change is, I will start with them there and then kind of, again, educate. Like, hey, your activity level's here. We may need to do some of this. Key factor, I think I just heard you say, is their motivation for change. Correct. So you're trying to work off of... What's, what's your motivating factor? What's the thing that drives you to even want to have a conversation with me about your, your eating habits, Correct. Your diet? Um, so would you put that at the top of the list? There's got to be motive or motivation for change. Absolutely. Yeah. Reminds me of that book, Who Moved My Cheese? Mm-hmm. It's, mine is Who Moved My Chunky Monkey? <laughs> so um, it, in this environment where we were talking about Zach over here and he was kind of having that crash he had been uh, eating mainly protein for a number of days Mm -hmm. and he was getting what I've always referred to as the workout flu Mm -hmm. where he he had we were like this dude's got COVID you know he's we're going to send him to the doctor and make sure he's not ill and infecting us all Mm -hmm. Um, I love teasing these guys but it ended up he was just you didn't really have strep did you zach uh, the doctor said i did you know so oh, we're yeah. gonna have to have him sign a hipaa form and <laughs> then i can release his medical information but i'm actually still uh doing keto too you are still doing keto 30 something days in yeah. yeah you need to talk to cheryl afterwards here i'm sorry cheryl that's okay How, if I, how's if it I, worked I, out for if you if i may on yeah. that one one of the other things that when people come in and want to talk about specific diets I ask a series of questions to try to figure out exactly how much about that do you know and understand. Keto is a very popular concept and term right now, but the the actual ability to get into ketosis requires a number of factors. So you were talking about eating a lot of meat. Well, depending on what kind of meat it was, it's keto has to do with the fat content of your diet, not protein. So just consuming a lot of proteins and not eating any carbs isn't actually a ketogenic diet. So it's, again, that educational component, like, hey, where are you? What do you know? I can help you do this. Are you aware that these are the actual components that are required to execute that if that's the genre that you want to hang out in for your lifestyle for a while? So just... I can remember years ago when I was doing this fitness competition, I was 18 years old and I had my trainer had me go through this, um, he called it the glycogen burn. Mm -hmm. And it was 10 days of skinless, boneless chicken breast and egg whites. And my mom back then was ready to kill me because I was going through a couple dozen eggs each day. Mm -hmm. And you know, the BJ's Wholesale Club back then, they would sell these big bags of boneless, skinless chicken breast. And all I would do is nuke it in the microwave and eat this, these egg whites. No, you tried that for a little while, didn't you? Um, and it was horrible. And I went through that, that workout flu or that just feeling mm-hmm. uh, terrible. And so what's happening to my body? I didn't really know the science behind it. I was just following the rules. Um, what are we doing any damage to our organs when we do it that strict? So like is the kidney, like with the, I think the creatine and those type buildups, what, what happens to your body when you're, when you're doing things that radically? We actually, you brought this up a little bit when I said macros before we came yeah. um, and went on and referencing micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, electrolytes. A lot of times people get hangry because they're dehydrated. Hmm. So when you're not eating enough in general, you may not be consuming enough fluid, which has to do with how your muscles, joints, tendons, brain function, all of those kinds of things. Um, In addition to that, electrolytes. So your cells can't function without sodium and potassium. And a lot of times those nutrients are coming from the foods that you're eating. So if your diet is super, super restricted and limited, you can be cutting yourself short on the, the micronutrient side of the house that helps your body convert macros from food into calories and energy mm. and protein building blocks and things like that. So a few days 
Not a big deal as far as taxing on your organs. I mean, your body is very, very intelligent. It's going to, to keep you alive, but things are definitely not optimal. I mean, I bet on day two or three of that, if you sat, sat down to take a test, a test that you had taken before, with information that you know, you would probably not do as well because you're mentally distracted or fatigued yeah. or something along those lines. It doesn't mean you don't know the information. It just means that your your body's more worried about keeping yourself upright, awake in that chair than it is about finding the knowledge that you need to complete the task at hand. You know, I, I was saying to you earlier um, that I read, and I don't know who to credit for this quote, but uh, you, you had alluded to earlier in our podcast that, you know, people have this image and how do they look in front of the mirror? Um, how do they look in front of the mirror naked, I think you said. Um but I read where 80% of how you look is what you put in your body, what you feed it, and 90% of how you feel is what you put in your body and what you feed it. Um, I don't know that that's scientific scientific, Mm -hmm. or if it's just, you know, an interesting quote. Um, What would you say to that quote? What would you say to hearing someone say that? Is there some science behind that? I, there's definitely some data behind that. I think the percentages are probably a little ballooned, okay. if you will. B- really ballooned? Um, yeah, I think they're probably just round numbers. You okay. know what I mean? Um, there, there's inflation with everything to make it sound <laughs> a little bit better, a little bit sexier. I definitely believe that 80% of the way that you feel, perform, think, again, 979 82, whatever percent you want to call it, has to do with what you put in your body. And it's not just food. I talked about hydration a minute ago, the same. I mean, cognition is really hard with a dehydrated body, you know, running stairs or doing a workout, really difficult to do. I mean, the first thing that you would fall out from a workout from is going to be dehydration. It has more to do with the fluid than it does to do with Mm -hmm. your energy levels. That's interesting. You know, we were talking about Navy, Navy Special Warfare and a uh, family member who's going through some training right now um, uh, with the Army, one of their tactics versus making them wet and cold is starving them um, and then having a high calorie content. So there's one part of their training where it's estimated that they're burning 20,000 calories a day and intaking about 2,500 calories. Mm-hmm. And then they're depriving them of sleep. They're getting plenty of, of, of hydration. They don't want them to, to stroke out. Um, but they're taking sleep and food away and forcing a high, high um, activity level. And the first thing that goes is their, their thinking, their mm-hmm. cognitive uh, capability. And what they're trying to instill in these guys is being able to train under those conditions so that if they operate, it's the one article I read said it's the closest thing they can get to what we sometimes refer to as the fog of war. That if you can, you know, starve them, starve the mind, lower the cognitive capability, uh, which is what you're referring to here is that mm-hmm. what you're putting in your body when you're feeling that brain fog, when you're feeling it, it's probably just means you either need to hydrate or feed your body some nutrient. Mm-hmm. The mac- macronutrients, did I get that mm-hmm. right? Um, so th- those things that you do to your body, is there tips that you can give us in terms of how we should listen to our body? If I, if I feel anxious or hyper, is there some food that I can eat to maybe bring that into check? But if I feel lethargic or like I'm crashing, can you give me some thoughts or education there? So I talked about... Li- listening to your hunger and satiety cues, the more... What's that word again? Satiety. Feeling satisfied. Oh, feeling... Okay. Ah, nice. My new vocab word today. There you go. So the more dialed in you are to those things, the more self-aware you can become with other things. And again, I'm just the dietitian, the food lady. Um, When I work with individuals, I typically tell them of 100% of the puzzle, sleep is probably about 60% of that argument for optimization. Wow. 
in your deeper phases of sleep, your body is releasing the highest concentration of recovery hormones, regeneration for all of your muscles, organs, you know, cognitive functioning, all of those things are happening at night in your deeper phases of sleep. So if your sleep is shallow or alcohol induced or medical required, it's a shallow sleep and you're not hitting those deeper phases. So you're kind of shorting yourself a little bit. Alcohol induced. I, I've noticed today I'm the only one who's been partaking. I had some. You did? I, I'm, did. I missed that. Um, so sleep, alcohol, crazy night of partying, mm-hmm. and I need to get back into my, my routine again. The, the sleep makes up 60%. How does alcohol affect the body and what what's your recommendations and i know these are general Mm -hmm. recommendations so you're not giving specific advice to anybody today don't act without talking to your nutritionist personally um but alcohol content uh where does it fall on a scale of acceptable to bad boy for you so let's let's work backwards okay if your head is hitting the pillow at 11 you shouldn't put anything into your body that has calories after 9 p.m., give or take. Okay. Um, sleepy time teas, anything that's not caffeinated or that you're not adding sugar to is completely fine. And again, two hours is a rough estimate. We're talking general here. Okay. The reason for that is anytime you put something with macronutrients into your body, for your body to break it down and turn it into energy to use later, it's generating heat. It's called the thermic effect of food. Hmm. Well, if your body's generating heat, and to get into your deeper phases of sleep, your core temperature wants to go down, you're introducing a counterbalance. So you want to be able to have your body get into the cooler core temp, deeper phases of sleep earlier on, so you want that two hour-ish window for between eating and when your head hits the pillow. As far as alcohol is concerned, that portion of your plate that is carbs in the form of sugars and starches, okay. for females, if they wanted to swap out that part of the plate for a serving of an alcoholic beverage. For females, again, adjusted for portion sizes is one fist, so one alcoholic beverage for the ladies, which is a one and a half ounce pour of any sort of liquor, uh, excuse me, 12 ounces of beer, six ounces of wine. For men, again, typically larger stature anatomically, they get two servings of alcohol for that portion of the plate that is carbs in the form of sugars and starches. Still though, two-ish hours before or greater before your head hits the pillow. When Does that it, include passing out? When, <laughs> when it's Zach. a cheat or a tre- treat, <laughs> meaning more than one for the ladies, more than two for the gentlemen, you're going to have a harder time falling asleep. Even though you had two hours before your head hit the pillow, it takes longer for your body to process out alcohol than it does most macronutrients because yeah. your liver has to work on it. When your liver is trying to filter something out, it's still generating that heat longer into the night. But the, the liver's evil, and it must what do you be mean punished. The liver's evil. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that. Yes. Oh, okay. So yeah, just kidding. We need that liver. So if the liver's filtering, still generating heat longer into the night, less lower core temp, more yeah. tossing and turning, less deeper phases of sleep, and a lot of people they either drink due to mental needing comfort or physical pain relief. And after a while, two's okay, four is better. So years and years of very shallow sleep is going to result in your body's metabolism slowing over time, not getting the hormones that you need, and that can lead to medical-related issues and hormone dysregulation. Jeez, hormones. I'm just the bearer of good news. Everybody just loves to have me around. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, it's great information, and I'm learning a ton. So, thanks which is for, why you drink for, earlier. In yeah, the day. I got that early out of the way. That's awesome. Um, I guess the the part I have to work on is what I do two hours before bedtime. So, and Zach, remember that when you're having your wild weekend, um, you need two hours before you pass out <laughs> or blackout. I think you you call them blackouts, right? Um, God, I love that guy. Um, he's a stud, by the way. He, he can do. I'm gonna put a microphone over here. Yeah, you you should, because I I would love to hear your feedback on some of this. And um, Zach needs a lot of help, so I'm actually going to refer him to you, and that he should have a conversation with you off camera about his eating habits, because it it could be um, critical to his employment okay. that if he comes in with that hangry attitude again. Um, 
and I don't want to be in prison. So, you know, that's. Yeah. Tell us, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Zach, for putting that on there today. I was just waiting for a moment when I could use it. Uh, Kathleen's calling me right now. She's probably wanting to know how our interview is going. How am I doing? Uh, you're awesome. It's great. <laughs> okay. I'm lear- learning a ton. I think we're going to get a lot out of this. So, um, if if we can go now to kind of how exercise plays into this eating right. Mm-hmm. So we got these macronutrients we're dealing with, these micronutrients, and sleep, and then you know partying with the alcohol. Um, if if I'm a fit person, mm-hmm. and let's say I'm working out five times a week, 30 minutes or more, or some higher fitness, and there's some things you've done in your life I want to talk to you about before I let you go today. Um, it, how does that change my calorie intake? So how should I change my eating habits if I'm, you know, doing a, a one day workout or a two a day workout, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, and depending on, I guess, what I'm doing, weight training, running, aerobic, anaerobic. Um, how does that change my, my eating profile? So we can reference those plates again. Okay. We talked about the 25% carbs, 50% fiber, 25% protein. And we didn't even get to the, the fat servings that correspond to that. But That's they're, my favorite. They're included there, too. Um, if after a workout you're going to have a meal for recovery, those portions then shift. And it becomes a third of the plate all the way around basically increasing the size of the carbohydrates to help replenish the carbohydrates that your body just burned during that workout. I think I referred earlier to when you're exercising, your body likes carbs at moderate to high intensity. Okay. Um, versus at rest, your body prefers fats. You're always burning both, but the ratio at the point in time is dictated by intensity. So if I can throw in something there, that there's the guys in the industry that um, are buddies of mine who have fitness drinks or energy drinks. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I talked about this when I hired you to, to help me. And, you know, I, I like an occasional energy drink. And we were talking about the, the sugar versus no sugar. Mm-hmm. Uh, expand on that for me and help folks understand how uh, energy drinks can affect your uh, blood sugar and your how you metabolize things. Absolutely. So... Energy drinks in and of themselves is a misnomer, especially in today's day and age where things are low to no calories. Um, Energy means fuel. Fuel means calories. So when companies are marketing energy drinks, they're actually just talking about caffeine and stimulant enhanced beverages, Hmm. not actual macronutrients that are giving your body fuel, meaning energy. So that, that, I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole of a conversation right there yeah i was going to say i would come up a whole podcast just talking about those (laughs) absolutely all the drinks that are on the market and from from weed to bang right so (laughs) all all of the things cbd i mean yes um (laughs) so what what happens when we take uh intake these uh energy drinks especially the ones that have uh no calories no sugar um uh, no carbs. I, I get a little sketched out. So I'm like, well, what kind of chemical is this and what's it doing to my body? So help, help me understand that. So typically it's the caffeine or the herbal version of caffeine. There are multiple herbal, herbal versions of caffeine that they okay. put in those drinks and they don't actually disclose how many milligrams of total caffeine are in them. When you hmm. ingest caffeine, it acts as a stimulant, stimulating your cardiovascular system. When you stimulate your cardiovascular system, you go into your body and start to pull and release carbohydrates so that you Mm. have energy to fuel. That's kind of how stimulants work a little bit. Um, And they enhance blood flow in general. So energy drinks are basically mobilizing your body's already existing fuel sources by upregulating your cardiovascular system. So basically tricking your body into thinking that you're putting in fuel when basically you're just going into the vaults and pulling out what you have. That's interesting. So what happens to guys that, I mean, I know some dudes that are drinking five and six of these 
drinks a day. And I'm not talking about eight ounces. I'm talking about 12. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's almost like the old beers we used to drink, the big 44 ounces. <laughs> There's these massive cans of, mm -hmm. of stimulant. Um, it, have you seen any studies or anything on the long-term effects of putting this stuff in your body? I mean, energy drinks have been around for a while, but yeah. I don't know that they've been around long enough for very well-documented research to exist. <clears throat> so, I mean, my short answer would be no, I haven't seen any long-term studies. It doesn't mean that they're not out there. Well, you're, you're, you went to University of Florida, right? I did. So your alma mater is like the founding platform of almost, would you consider Gatorade and energy is drink? It's a sports drink. It's a sports drink. So, and right. So now we're talking about the misnomer of energy drinks versus, yeah. versus uh, sports or performance which actually has calories in it. Okay. Gatorade, carbohydrates, yeah. high in sugar, electrolytes, correct, yeah. fluid to keep yeah. you performing in the hot, humid Florida environment. Gatorade is thirsty. Fueling the gators. That yes. deep down body thirst. There you go, Gatorade. Send me a check. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so what's the difference between like a sports drink and, some, you know, there are some guys out there, some ladies who will pick on sugary sports drinks like mm -hmm. it's bad and maybe it is i don't i don't know um versus the energy drink so can you help our listeners understand the difference between those two absolutely so with energy drinks i was talking about the misnomer of just a lot of caffeine artificial or natural sweeteners not a lot of calories therefore no real fueling energy from macronutrients whereas Sports drinks or performance drinks have carbohydrates in them because at moderate to high intensity, your body's primary fuel choice is carbohydrates. So that beverage is not only giving you fluid to keep you hydrated, but calories from carbohydrates, actual energy calories that you're ingesting during that exercise to be able to continue to perform at that higher level of intensity. They also put electrolytes in there for cell functioning and all of those other things. Hmm. So, you know, the on the market today is obviously we, we Gatorade, mm -hmm. and they've changed their formula around over the years. Is that more of a marketing thing that they've done where they've, you know, cut the sugar or they've, you know, maybe thrown some protein in it? Is that really just uh, Coca-Cola doing its job of, of great marketing? So any any sports drink, so and there's dozens of them, you know, Powerade, Endurox, hundreds of them out there. Gatorade's not the only one. But originally, marketing tools were play sports, drink this beverage. Yeah. Well, we as Americans are like, well, if some is good, more is better. Mm -hmm. And instead of drinking water, because nobody, you know, water's boring. It doesn't taste like anything. I don't want this. They were then drinking sports beverages to stay hydrated. Well, again, sugar, calories yeah. by themselves, if you're not working out and you're just drinking it to stay hydrated, is resulting in that blood sugar dysregulation. And if you're consuming extra carbs, whether it's from a sports beverage or Chunky Monkey ice cream and you're not exercising, come on, come on. where do those calories go? The wrong yeah. the wrong place. Yeah. So They go to my biceps. To to <laughs> you're a lucky man. You've got great <laughs> genetics. But they, they tend to <laughs> flop a little. Yeah. So in response to the general population's desire to consume things that don't taste like water, sports beverage companies have changed their formularies to now have like, this one is only for hydration. So all that it has in it is fluid and a little bit of electrolytes, not a lot of calories. Here are some that have half the amount of calories from carbohydrates. So if you do, you know, a three to five mile light jog with the dog, this one is for you. Versus if you're going out and getting after it, with a weighted yeah. ruck for five miles on the soft sand in the beach, here's the full carbohydrate plus fluid plus electrolyte formula for you. So, they're, they're so your recommendation then, and how you would put these energy drinks or uh, sports performance mm -hmm. drinks back into your diet, what's, what's the recommendations, the general recommendations that you give to your, your clients? It's dictated by your exercise. Okay. Uh, level, intensity, duration. Yeah. So if you're running your dog on the beach, you can have a sports drink. Or maybe if you have a lab, you, <laughs> yes. you need a you need an energy drink. And personal preference. 
Hmm. I personally like to eat my calories. So I'll get back from a beach run and do just water, but that's when I'll have, you know, twice as many sweet potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it depends on the person. So you're, you're a beach person? Very much. Yeah, uh, and you, I think in your bio you told me you, you have a lab. I do. She's going to be two in August. Wow. What's her name? Cora. I couldn't pronounce. I was looking. I was like, I'm not sure. She's a little red lab. So Cora is heart in French. Oh, she has cool. my heart. Um, so it's often said that pets are uh, emulate or a picture of their owner. So you have a lab. Guess what my dog is? I have two dogs, but there's a dog that emulates Kathleen, and there's a dog <laughs> that emulates Kenny. Okay. What do you think my dog is? A bulldog. Ah, uh, you're close. Marines, that's pretty close. <laughs> he kind of is in the, the bulldog. He's an English Mastiff. Nice. Yeah, he's a big, okay, slothy, no. lazy, you know, the only thing he'll get up for is to pee, poop, and eat, which is pretty close. <laughs> and I'll do a podcast, too, so. And then we have a German Shepherd. And right now, Betsy is amazing, but Kathleen hates her. Oh. Um, nah, I'm just, hate's a strong word. <laughs> um, all those dog lovers will be attacking <laughs> Kathleen. She's a little hyper. Uh, mm. Probably How like old? the lab. Uh, will be two very soon. Still a puppy. I think August. Um, yeah, still a puppy. And we have a uh, an ex-team guy who's her trainer. Mm. And... Uh, it, we actually just got her back because she needed some remedial training. Mm. She was being a little, uh, a little extra. behavior disorder. Yeah. A extra. And uh, sent her out to the farm to get some some remedial training. We probably are the ones that actually need to go and get the training. But um, So you, a dog, you, your dog is something that helps keep you fit, I'm sure. Keeps she, you, does, she keeps uh, me accountable. Lab. Yeah. Yeah. If there's more than a few hours of meal plan writing or sedentary behavior, she's all about it. Mom, you, let's go. Do you go. write a meal plan for your lab, too? Mom, let's go. No, but she eats like a queen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kathleen used to do this diet for our dogs. It was uh, whole chicken, bones included, non-cooked. Oh, wow. Nice. And then we would order this um, this bag of food that had sweet potatoes. It was a lot like the diet that you feed me. It was oh. it was dog food. <laughs> whoa, um, whoa. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I love that. Um, but no, these dogs ate, ate great. And it just, it got really just over the top because we were like chopping up this mm-hmm. chicken and mixing it in with this prepared um, vegetable plate. And there for a while, Brady ate better than I did. And uh, thanks to Cat. Um, love you, babe. Um, well, were you in the doghouse? I, I, I stay in the doghouse <laughs> always. Like that phone call, it's probably, I'm not sure what I did, but I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, again, when I, I look at my pet and just thinking back and bringing that back to our conversation today, when Brady was eating that way and eating these whole foods, and he's on a good dog food now. My vet's going to call me after watching this podcast and chastise me, but... He was eating these whole foods, uh, you know, uh, raw chicken, and his coat was amazing. Shiny. Uh, it, yeah, he, his coat was shiny, and his fitness was at a high level. Now Brady's, for a mastiff, he's old. He's eight years old. Um, so getting close to, to end of life for him, um, which is sad, but he's a good boy. Um, but he's... 205, somewhere around there. Big, big dog. Mm-hmm. But he's tend to have changed his diet. And I've just noticed that as we were talking today and I was uh, th- thinking about these questions for you that, man, just it, it kind of made me feel a little guilty that maybe we need to change our diet with Brady again and maybe get him back to that old eating habit, which was the better eating habit of having those whole foods and um, that, that's a lot of what I've learned from you in the in uh, the meal preparation and the meal strategy I hate to call it meal plan because it sounds so um, uh, like you got this routine you've got to do it right but it's really just having better habits right mm-hmm. and um, you know it's uh, garbage in garbage out right so you put crap in your body and it's going to perform crappy. Mm. Um, so 
it, and we're getting close on on time today to kind of close things out. But you know, if you had some major uh, pointers or takeaways that you could give folks um, as little things that they could do to improve uh, their their eating strategy, eating habits, exercise. What are maybe some of your top three, top six um, things that you would tell folks to do as a good start to improving their their lifestyle? The first one may sound silly, but I would say take a day or two and either in the notes section of your phone or a notebook somewhere, actually jot down everything that you eat and drink or Hmm. supplements that you take in one day. Most people aren't aware of what they're actually doing. And most of the time, if you just look at what your results are, people are smart enough to figure out, I I could change X number of things on this sheet of paper all by myself without any help. So it's just bringing about a better sense of awareness. Um, The second one would be drink more fluids. Most people just, they don't pay enough attention to hydration. Johnny Walker, Blue Moon. (laughs) (laughs) Water would be great. (laughs) <laughs> so drink more fluids, but in, in all seriousness, the, the alcohol, how much should a person generally uh, monitor their alcohol intake? So if we're talking about the evidence that's out there in the guidelines, it's one to two a day for gents, one for the ladies. Okay. And I talked about how to like modify yeah. your plate to make all that make sense. Um. And no, it doesn't mean I didn't drink my 12 Monday through Saturday, so Sunday I can have 14. Remember, I've worked with guys for a long time. I know how that math goes. Um, That's not how balance happens, but that's kind of what the the guidance is as of today. And I think you pointed this out earlier with the red wine. There have been research benefits to consuming alcohol from cardiovascular health and wellness standpoint and other things. So, you know, cost-benefit. Yeah. But as we mentioned, moderation, moderation and yeah. a little bit of time before bed to let your body recover. Damn that moderation. Yeah, it's so boring. Yeah, right. Mm. But if you if you want a long, healthy life, then moderation it's sounds like it's key. So um, jotting down what you what you intake, you, you suggest doing that for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Uh, increasing your hydration and really what you're talking about there is your your H two O, your water. Yep. Um and anything else so what the third one would be are you getting a little bit of protein and a little bit of healthy fat with all of your meals or just one of them with your snacks most of the time snacks tend to be very carbohydrate dominant Hmm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you pair it with at least one of the other two to help slow and regulate how your body absorbs it and chooses to use it as a fuel source gotcha um, we've, we've got about five minutes. Okay. Uh, any, any more than those top three? Anything else? Well, we those should are be the in? big ones. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about Cheryl personally for a few minutes, if that's cool with you. Okay. No, I'm terrified. All right. Now, okay. Now you're going to drink. <laughs> I'm going to drink. Uh, um, what, what I found really interesting in your bio was you've ran multiple marathons. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Grew up. That's insane to if, me. I've never done that. If I had to pick a, a genre, I was a soccer player growing up. Um, Ian. Ian was a collegiate soccer yes, player. Yes, nice. I was a sweeper. I, was, I, I like to take you out before you get to my goalie. <laughs> I was a janitor. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of running in soccer. Uh, that sucks. Grew up in Jersey, went to Florida, an out-of-state school. So tuition a little, little bit higher yeah. for an out-of-stater. So worked a couple jobs, and I could afford some running shoes. Run was a cheap habit at the time, and I could still get the endorphins, the feel goods, yeah. from the exercise. Man, that has never kicked in for me. With I had to do it in the Marine Corps, and I'll do it because I know it's good for my heart. I don't, I don't get that runner's high. It's just but do you get I'm it from like lift, mother lifting? Time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it Gen- must be the Viking blood in me, right? So. Yeah. Everybody's, you got to find your genre. Yeah. Uh, Chunky Monkey, I get some real... <laughs> it's a serotonin. Yeah. That's, oh, that's we talked different. about that. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, this is about you. So, r- r- running um, marathons, I don't, I don't get, but okay, I'm, I'm tracking with you. Well, I had to pick yeah. a goal. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm competitive. Okay. I mean, I work in sports. That's 
kind of my thing. So you want to have, have a chunky monkey eating contest with me one day? Mm, I might give you a run for your money. Okay. All right. Actually, we, if we can, I'll have you back on the show. We'll okay. do that. We could do one chunky monkey and one pizza. Pizza all each under the table. Oh, that's challenge accepted. <laughs> Pongo Pizza, shout out to the locals. I mean, nice. Pongo Pizza and ice cream. Yes. That that's I'm gonna like I'm gonna be a nutritionist. I'm gonna compete with you, and we're gonna see who who wins in that. So okay, I'll I'll give ice cream diet and pizza diet. So you might be a client of mine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, I need to learn from the best. That's all right. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so yeah. So you're doing these marathons. How many marathons have you done? Probably six or seven. What? Yeah. Jeez. Do you have any lined up? I do not. So when I moved to Virginia, uh, I haven't, I've, I've won run. I ran one with my best friend last year, the Shamrock. She had not run a marathon. She wanted a, a buddy. She finished? So Yes. Man, that's amazing. Yep. That's 5. awesome. 515. Congrats. She beat her. She wanted to do 530, and we beat it by 15 minutes. So. Yeah. I mean, anything under six hours, your first one's like. Yeah. Uh, it was huge. Yeah. It was awesome. Good for her. Um, the 50 mile. What's her name? Her name is Katie. Katie, Katie Wilson. congratulations. Yeah. That's, that's great. Good She's for her. She's my best friend since college. Awesome. It's been a minute. Yeah. Then I got roped into the Ultra. That was my, my first CO when I was out at And an Ultra is what? It was a 50 miler trail oh race. Oh my God. Pacific Crest Trail. It was brutal. Okay. Don't you guys just feel like complete sloths right now? <laughs> Six marathons. No, what are you like? Well, I worked out this morning. You did? Okay, good for you. It is 11, 16. Okay. Yeah. What? What's that? You oh, get, yeah, we got to get you, you out of here. That. <laughs> um, all right, so you, you like to surf and paddleboard. Yes, sir. That's pretty awesome. I'm um, a beach girl. Yeah, that's cool. What? Uh, what's your, your, your preference? Are you like, uh, what is it, left side of the lip? I don't know. I'm goofy, about. yes. Goofy, goofy footed, yeah. I'm goofy. Where's your favorite place to surf? Sunset Cliffs, San Diego. Nice. Have you been down, um, what's the longest left line in the world down in um, Costa Rica? Have you been down A there? surf trip is on my bucket list. I have never been on one. And we, I've been surfing for probably like eight or, n- eight or nine years. Yeah, Kat and I were in Costa Rica last year, and we were going to try to make that trip. And I, I'm not a surfer, but I, I appreciate the sport, and it's beautiful. Um, I would have probably, like, sponge board or body boarded or, you know, did something stupid out there on the waves, but... As long as you're um, having a good time doing it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'd have been like a porpoise, you know. The shark would have come and got me. <laughs> um, but that that has like the, one of the longest, I guess, left lines in the world. And um, we were going to go out and we couldn't get to it because it was so crazy windy that day oh. and just didn't work out. But, yeah, that's, uh, that's a place that I hear all my surfer buddies say, you, you got to go try in Costa Rica. So, um, so. I usually like to ask folks, what are you reading now? What's your, your, your top read? What Anything outside of that academic world? Is there any reading that you would suggest to folks right now to take a look at? Any nutrition uh, books, maybe? Have you written a book yet? I have not. Yeah, write your book. I'm, I'm going to do a cookbook first. Really? Yeah. But there will be a preface in the beginning that gives the gu- nice. some guidance. you got to put your peanut butter oatmeal in there. That that is awesome. The peanut butter it will be in there. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, well, look, we got to. You've got an appointment to go to, and uh, I went way over on time with you today. So we got four seconds left to get off this. That's all right. It was podcast. fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed. Thank you for helping me get my my nutritional life in order. It's been great. I'm glad Lou referred us, and uh, I'd love to have you back on one day. And when you get that cookbook. Okay. Please uh, let us know. We'll we'll help you promote it and put it out there on the show. Appreciate it. Thank and you. what we'll do on the front side of the show is I'll I'll tell folks how to uh, reach you if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, any specific clientele that you like to specialize with or like work with, that they can be slothful like me. Yep. Um, Everybody's pretty. a puzzle, yeah. and that's what keeps it interesting. Fine. Okay. Well, great, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I had a blast doing this with you today, and uh, we look forward to having you back on in the future. Thanks. My pleasure. All right. See you around. Bye. Bye. Thank you.